Um, what uh, moved me the most was that what the walk has given to them. It's like to the walk, it has given them like a pathway, like a bridge, and also gave a lot of the people out there a voice that they have that are not being heard. And it's cleansing the land, and we're bringing back something that was lost. Our collective dream is to find peace, stability, and progress in life. This what inspires immigrant families like mine to move to Australia. However, even as I grow in gratitude, love, and respect about our new home, I'm beginning to learn the harsh truths about our country's history. To acquire wealth, you need the land, all right? And you can't acquire the wealth off the land if you can't have access to the land. That's where the big companies and that sort of, well, they, the British came here to take the land, deal with the population as it sees fit and actually plunder the resources because that's where they made their money out. Today, the process is still the same, only the Australian government has now taken over the reins. The stealing of our children has gone up by 400% in the last decade. The imprisonment rate of our women has gone tenfold. Our suicide rate since the intervention has gone up by about 250%. We've had kids as young as six years of age take their own life. We still have the lowest life expectancy in this country and the highest infant mortality rate. These are all statistics that this country should be ashamed of. This is a convict penal colony manifest. Never got a treaty with the original people. Never got consent. Never got proper jurisdiction. So how they're an authority. They're an illegal racist regime in anyone else's language on the planet. They're part of an invasion, a British colony. And people don't want to deal with reality. So they live the law of the, the invader themselves. They pay the taxes to these people. Think it's okay. It's not. You're living on someone's sacred land. You've been destroying those people and their land since they got here. You know, what? can't people understand about that reality? My family was not um, very rich. I didn't go all the way to year 12, just dropped out of year 11. You know, I grew up on the streets for two years as a homeless man. I understand the struggle of homelessness and got myself off the streets life. The only thing about growing up as a Aboriginal person from Perth is the, the judgement that you get judged from society itself because of before being who you are. And sometimes I used to think to myself, uh, why was I was born as an indigenous man? Why, why could I be born as someone else, as a white person, because everyone respects you? And then I realised that, well, hold on, it's, it's, it's because these people do not understand who we are and they don't know nothing about us. We need to teach them. A lot of the deaths in custody and also the procedures, what the police do. It induces a condition called excited delirium positional asphyxia where the police make the people that they're arresting lay flat on their stomach. They place their hands at the back of their neck and put their hands behind and placing pressure on the back of the neck. We have a nerve, it's called the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve actually stems from the back of the neck all the way down and it goes down to the right side, the left side. And with that added pressure, what the police do, it induces a, a heart attack because it puts so much pressure on the heart. I mean, we've got our young children who've got nothing to look forward to. Even the word shame, I do not like the word shame. It restricts our people and our children to think outside the square and to step outside the square. And that one word alone has affected our people mentally as well as physically throughout the generations. And we need to empower our young children in mind, body and very spiritually. Due to the impacts of colonisation with dispossession and not being able to practice culture, the missions, forcing our people apart and off country, breaking up families and stuff, there's a lot of intergenerational trauma. What we try and focus on is force the government to, you know, give us missions back or give us pockets of land or give us what we're rightfully entitled to so that we can heal our people our way and create healing centres with a rehabilitation and family and cultural focus so that our people can heal holistically because there's a lot of our alcohol and, and drug addictions as well as gambling and things like that you know so there's a lot of these these kind of things that impact on our people's ability to progress or even just live and function on a day-to-day -day life. Them trying to dictate to us is us trying to teach Chinese language to Chinese people you know you, you it's ridiculous. <laughs>
I wanted to step it up a bit and to say, look, this government and West Australian police are just kicking us to the curb and we need to fight back and stand up for something that can be achieved. So this is when I one day I decided to sit up around the spirit fire. The spirit fire is like a big major fire on the island where all the spirits hang around and came up with an idea to do a big massive walk across Australia because uh, for one, the city of Perth and the police kept on raiding us and pushing people along and I needed to figure out a way how to keep the voice alive. So the walk started off was for, was for the force closures of the communities and for the homeless. And my elders were telling me that you should not cut your hair and you should not shave because you're going through like initiation, you're following all the song lines and you're becoming a man. And also if you want the support from your people and you want to stay true to the people, you must not go through the Nullarbor, you must go through the outback, through the central desert and do it the proper way for the people. As I learned more about these harsh truths, I realised that some conservative Aboriginal leaders choose to further their own agenda over the needs of First Nations communities. I feel that you know, government have got such a stronghold on how our organisations are run. Sometimes that takes away what they're there for. I've been quite vocal about reminding a lot of those organisations why they were set up. You know, they were once a political voice for us. However, through government interference and control, that that voice is, you know, it's not there anymore. Most of those conservative Aboriginal people, they visit poverty, they don't have to live there. They'll visit their poor family relations. They are um, timid people by nature. They sit back. I saw it here in the early 70s when we led a lot of the marches in the community here when it was radical to get out and march. They would shun us, they would turn their face away. They will, by their nature, wait for radical people to do the hard work and then come in behind them and stab them in the back and try and take over organisations that we created. Now those marches and that advocacy is what led to a lot of the um, advances our people made. Those organisations that we set up to protect and maintain housing for us couldn't do that very very long time ago and the organisation should have been shut down because of the incompetence and the level of mismanagement there but the state always allowed it to operate because it was easy for them to let the housing company do the bidding of the state. I'm now connecting with all different cultural people and it's, that's what amazes about this walk is because it has opened up a new door to get everyone to realise, you know, this. They're just people just like us and, and we're all just human beings just want things to get better for everyone and this is why I made the decision that this walk is not just for my people, it's for everyone now. It's a very tough journey to walk on. What makes it so tough is hearing all the sad, upset and crying and hurt stories and experiencing and seeing with our own eyes. The physical is fine, I can walk but it's here, it's the mind, the memory machine to go through all these lists and going through it all but when it comes to hearing stories about back in the days when elders were young and the church would try to break the culture out of them by tying them to the table and whipping them with chains and that. And we hear all these, these sad and hurt stories and the, the anger and, and the people just had enough. They're not supplied with fresh water. Mining companies have been out there polluting all the water and the government doesn't want to help them out in that respect. Well, if they don't have fresh water, they can't really stay in places. So if they leave the land, the government can walk in and claim it. Whereas if they go in there, they have to compensate, compensate them to get them to move from the communities. Cut off the power and cut off the water, and then they'll leave the land and the government can claim it, which is totally wrong. Well, that's part of their plan. If they <laughs> force them off the land, they have to give them money. If they get them to walk off the land because there's no power and no fresh water, they can claim the land, so it's just outright theft. There's, there's plenty of historical times where, when our people have stood up to the government and said, stop listening to your selected people. Listen to the grassroots people. So they know very well what they're doing. They select who they want to talk on their behalf and then they turn around and they say to the general public, but we listen to Aborigines. <laughs> they don't. They listen to some people that are full of, full of their own wind. The people they're listening to have two agendas. Fill out their CV, so in the hope of a better job, or pad their wallets out, that's about it. Well, we 
to have to live every day with the legacies of history yeah. wiped out here in just this place alone in Sydney. Yeah. Where recorded massacre sites, there are hist historically Aboriginal people were killed or died from the effects of uh, the smallpox. That's why we emphasise so much with Clinton and the war. We are, like a lot of the other communities in Australia, being forcefully removed from our area, from our community. Um, through the Black Organisation, the Aboriginal Housing Company, and its efforts to raise money rather than maintain a community means we've been sold out up there on the block. There will be more very well-to-do Asian students there than there will be Aboriginal people if the housing company gets its way mm -hmm. and builds the proposed Pemawai development. So that's the historical purges have happened twice in our community and this is the third and final purge where we get pushed out. I started this walk off September the 8th last year but before I was just an ordinary guy like anyone else. I was just an admin but I wanted more to life, to make a difference and make a change because I always, as a young child growing up in community life, I've seen and witnessed how my people were suffering, their voices are not being heard and as a young boy I used to dream about making the world as a better place and uh, make a difference. I never pursued because I was still learning and experiencing all that stuff in community life it was, it was very hard but when I was back in Perth there working, one day I um, was going home from work and I seen on the news that Mr Colin Barnett was going to close 180 communities and I didn't want communities to be closed down because I experienced what it's like in community life but also I wanted to make a stand to not put these communities closed down but also fight for things to improve community life. So that's when I decided to go to Harrison Island, like in our traditional language is Madagrab and it's a woman's bathroom ground. And to go down there and make a stand for it and actually stand up for what I believed as a child and do it now at the age of 25. There was still more, a lot of work needed to be done throughout this country itself. And I met my own family down there and I also met Muni and Gary on Harrison Island. That's how we all came together and met together and we all protested with each other as, as, as friends, but we also now, since being on this walk, become a, like a family. We're basically welcomed everywhere we go, you know, which is actually part of the amazing journey. I don't know what this government, you know, portrays these people, you know, to be so bad or whatever, whatever I like to say, you know. Go meet them, go talk to them. We want to all live together, but we're actually on their land because when we go through we're actually welcome to country and because Clinton's doing a cultural journey you know we're actually traveling under cultural protocol the whole way here it's incredible when I know your Australian history do what I did speak to First Nations people and they'll tell you the history before settlers arrived here our people used to walk across the land and used to trade and used to do ceremony on the song lines. And so we're doing a very cultural protocol in a way that each country that we come to, they must welcome us in. All our people understand it, they see what, we're, what I'm doing. They also give us gifts and food and assist us with anything we need and to get us from there where we need to get to, to Canberra. Despite the challenges that came his way, Clinton's perseverance and determination has reawakened the fighting spirit of First Nations communities. I've got to think about um, our culture, I've got to think about motivation, how to motivate the people, I've got to think about everything as a leader of the group. But with these guys, they just need to only need to talk about what frustrates them, and I've got to think of a way how to bring the people together. I wanted to overcome Dr. King and Gandhi and Nelson Mandela and use different teachings and create something bigger. Community life, you know, how to speak day to day. And yeah, then when I talk into the city life, I just speak their way and it's very confusing and it's like, ah, oh, damn. And so sooner or later I get stuck in the hang of it. The rest of this country needs to understand, you know, how, how bad it is for our people in this country. And I think Clinton being a young man and, and doing it the way he's done it, going through the communities the way he has, it's lit a lot of fires in people's bellies which have been dormant for such a long time to keep fighting for our people's rights. He's just given strength to so many people. So many of our people highlighted, you know, the plight of our people to white Australia. 
you like. To see mainstream media picking this war up, it demonstrates impact that, that he's having. Over the years of the embassy, Clinton came down and he just started learning about everything. And then all of a sudden he just said, I'm going to do this walk. And he just prepared for it and worked hard and did what he had to do, created a good support network around him and he just did it. Someone like Clinton, he would have sat and spoken to every single one and made sure they had their say. And that's the way of coming together and healing as a, as a nation. And I mean, now he's going to carry that through to Canberra. So that's awesome. I just want to say, appreciate uh, Clinton's walk, because he's bringing awareness to these, these real issues. I'm sure that, you know, his communities are suffering terribly. We know that. We've seen communities close down all over this country. And as he's walked along, it seems that it's really taken on board what the real issues are. What we would like to see is a full protection of our cultural rights, a full protection of our language rights, a full protection of our significant and sacred sites. You know, they could be no-go zones, like don't even go near them for development or anything like that. Let us manage our lands properly the way that we know best. Let us protect our waterways and, and take over the national parks and the management. We don't need to co-manage anything. Our people know the land, let us deal with it properly. All they've done is sought to destroy everything for development rather than worry about the sustainability future. What we keep trying to say is that the government can't fix our people. We are the only ones that can heal our people. And if they truly want to work with us and provide you know, the best way forward that benefits everybody, will they be listening to us? Well, every day, go on Facebook and have a look at the events pages. And if you see an Aboriginal protest rally here in, around Sydney or a forum, we're doing things constantly. Now what we encourage is non-Aboriginal people to come along because exactly that in the education system you'll learn nothing. If you go to some of our forums and if you go to all of our protest rallies you'll hear speakers that have been around for years. We ask people to join us in these things but not to take over. What we ask people if you come in, you know, we lead the way. We know what we're doing. We've been fighting this for 229 years. Sit, watch, observe. We need some of these environmental groups to recognise we have an inherent expertise in the field. If, if a rally and that's not for you, go into an Aboriginal community. People have this big fear and say, oh, but they've been fed by the media that we're all violent. That's media bullshit to keep people away from us. People I know who've done that have come out with a great experience. They go in with the right attitude, the right manner, and in a respectful way. Sit back and listen. Don't just jump in and start bang, 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 ask this, that and the other. Have a conversation. You'll find a lot of information coming your way that you'd never, ever dreamt you'd hear of. Clinton's walk reminds us that if we all work together, we can collectively change the course of our history for the better. I just wanted to go to Canberra to make a stand for him the communities and for the homeless people, but I did not realise that this walk was, was moving the people and inspiring the people and inspiring the world itself and that's how the walk started growing bigger because there was people thinking how can a young man walk for justice for everyone. It's the first time something like has happened in the southern hemisphere, like it has happened in the north hemisphere, but like I said I just wanted to stand up to, to make a difference in this world and then going through life I wanted to challenge it, I wanted to question it out, I wanted to show everyone that we're not bad people, we're actually good people. And also teach everyone as well, because that's what we have been doing on this walk about. What's been happening in community life and the issues that's been going on in communities and homelands and in, in, in towns and in, in cities and people starting to realise that there's still a lot of issues need to be dealt with and also on top to break that barrier of stereotype because we, the one thing that everyone must realise is that we're all from one planet. We're all brothers and sisters. We may from all different cultures and backgrounds. We all have different beliefs. Like I heard it from one guy from New Zealand. He said, we don't own the land, we are the land because we come from the land. 